Hello and welcome to Types of Computer, a class for students of IT at the British School of Warsaw. So, how do computers and microprocessors work? Well, for a start, you need an input. This is on an input device, such as a keyboard, a mouse, or a picture on a camera. This data is transferred to a processor. This processor will convert the data into digital formats and will try and do something with it. It may choose to store it, save it as a file on a floppy disk or a hard drive, it may choose to save it somewhere else, email it, however this is optional. The next stage is it outputs something. Say you push the letter K on your keyboard, it will be processed in the processor, maybe saved in a file on the store and then to be outputted as a K on the screen or as a K in a printer or a noise from a speaker. I hope that's all fairly simple. So, hardware. Hardware is something that is fixed and can be got hold of, like a monitor, keyboard or printer. Now, these devices can all carry out a range of specified tasks. Normally quite a limited range of tasks they can do. They push a button, they record a picture, they make a noise. Software gives them a list of instructions that they must follow and they do it. So for example, display the letter K on my screen, make a beep sound, print a piece of paper. In the bottom left hand corner you can see some icons for operating systems. There you have got Windows, OS X for Apple, and Linux. These are the translators or go-betweens between the software on your computer and the hardware itself. These will remember what hardware is in the machine, what is in the memory and where, and manage both between them. Above them you will see icons for applications. These are office applications like Microsoft Office and Open Office. These allow you to produce business documents on your computer in any way, shape or form. They use the hardware as it is directed by the operating systems. On the right, you will see another example of software. Applications. This is a new and rapidly growing field, but is still worth mentioning here. These applications are available on mobile phones and often take advantage of phone, sof phone software and the internet heavily. So, what's in that box which is whirring under your desk right now? Well, for a start, there is the CPU or Central Processing Unit. These contain up to 2.2 billion transistors in a square of silicon which is about 3 centimetres by 3 centimetres in diameter. They get extremely hot because they can calculate this many calculations every second. In fact, it is rumoured Intel research, look for research at NASA to provide the heat transfer solutions for their chips. But this is worth it because all operations on the computer, be it displaying a picture, doing calculations, 3D graphics, are directed by this processor. After 2.2 billion instructions a second can be processed. So, next comes RAM. This isn't an animal in a field with horns, it's random access memory. And this will contain all the data that your computer is currently working on. The more RAM you have, the more things your computer can do at once. At the moment, you can buy these chips in the picture, known as DIMMs, that hold up to 4 gigabytes of data. But the general rule of such things, or Moore's Law, is that this amount will double every two years. So within the next two years, expect to see 8 gigabytes on one DIMM. 
These are very fast and are very good short-term storage. But when the PC shuts down or power is cut to them, they lose all data. So they are only for short-term memory. ROM or read-only memory is different. The data cannot be edited at all. The data is permanent and some things will always stay the same in a computer. Needing to know where things are on the motherboard. Needing to know what the codes are for colours, to understand English and instructions to how the machine starts up are permanent and will always be constant. So they are written onto the chip and will not be changed. These you can turn on and off a million times and they will still store the same values. Next comes the graphics card. This is a separate processor with handles graphics. As you can see from the picture, they have their own sets of fans and cooling devices on board because, again, they get obscenely hot. These provide a processor solely for handling 3D graphics. These are vital for playing 3D games, as all fans of Call of Duty 4 or Grand Theft Auto will tell you. Then comes the hard disk. Hard disks hold the data permanently for your computer. Currently, you can buy a hard disk of up to 3 terabytes in size, which is huge. These hold data forever and ever and ever. It's held on a magnetic disk spinning round inside the hard drive. On the disk, it is things are read by an arm, which is a head on it spinning across the disks. These are now getting very fast, but they are still much slower than memory. This is why the computer uses memory for its short term storage and things it is working on. Optical drives. These are things like CD ROMs, DVDs, and Blu ray. They shine a laser onto a disc and measure the distance between the disc and the head and then use that to form data. They're strong, they are, can be traveled in cases quite easily and they are not very expensive. They are very good disposable storage if you need a small amount of data saved. They do read slower than hard disks though, so they are not the ideal backup choice if you want to do bigger backup jobs. So, types of computer. Well, these include desktop PCs. These are common in most, most computers in the world. These can function with or without a network. The data to run them is on the internal hard drive and they uh, can be standalone or networked. A laptop is a mobile computer which has similar power to a PCs today, although if you go back 10-15 years, they were much less powerful. Why were they less powerful? Well, they were designed to consume less power and produce less heat, which was a problem as we discussed earlier. Usually, they are lighter than PCs, although as you can see from the second lower picture of an original laptop from 1981, they can be quite big and bulky if you're not careful. PDAs and phones have grown in the last five years to become computers in their own right. A mobile phone today with 466 megahertz processors and with up to 32 gigabytes of RAM is considerably more powerful than a computer would have been even 10 to 15 years ago. They are portable, they have a good battery life, and often have a lot of functionality depending on wireless LANs. Tablets. These are handheld PCs, to give them another name. They are entirely based around a touchscreen interface. They have no moving parts. The storage doesn't use a spinning hard disk. They use something called a solid state device which is memory which holds data for a much longer period of time. They have very high levels of internet connectivity and all applications for them are generally downloaded via the internet. A thin client. 
A thin client is a screen with a network card attached to it. These have minimal processing power, but they're hooked up to a supercomputer or server centrally which has all the power and does all the calculations. If you want to have 25 computers doing a very limited range of tasks and very simple jobs, these are ideal because not a lot of data has to go across the network to the screen. However, you wouldn't want to do anything more than that. Most commonly, these are used in shops and supermarkets where the tools you see will only be a screen and any data we fed back to the central server. And finally, servers themselves. These are basically computers, but they have been customised to be far more connective. Their network cards are normally better. They can have vast quantities of storage and backup devices on board, and this is used to run programs and store files around the network. They can also manage the network and allow for files to be stored anywhere. However, they don't normally have good graphical capabilities because these are not needed in a server. So, finally, operating systems. Microsoft Windows is the world's largest operating system, partly because it runs on any hardware which is made for a PC. So IBM, Dell, Hewlett Packard. The other reason it is very big in the world is because it plays most games. Most games that are made use the Windows 3D drivers DirectX, which means they have to work on Windows. OS X is Apple's version. This only runs on Apple computers and hardware. This makes it very, very, very fast and efficient because it doesn't have to handle anything when it's not there. It's based around an old industrial server system called Unix, which makes it incredibly secure and virtually virus proof. I believe there have only been two viruses for Linux ever. When they first appeared, they were first used heavily by desk publishing films companies, and this has continued, and filmmakers now also use them widely along with photographers. Finally, we have Linux. Named after a Finnish computing student, he wanted to make a free version of the industrial computer program Unix, so he did. He made it free, and any software made for Linux is also free. It can be taken, edited, changed, rebranded, and it will still be used. In the picture behind the penguin, you can see logos for free of the major distributions of Linux being Red Hat, SUSE and Ubuntu. They are generally used in servers, but in desktops they aren't used widely, with the exception of netbooks, which do tend to use them quite a lot. Okay, that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you soon.